part of the glamour of opera lies in its traditions, its past, and the many fascinating personalities connected with it. We are fortunate in having with us during these intermissions Geraldine Farrar, who speaks to you from the little studio specially constructed for her in Box 42. In this studio, with its red and gold brocade, Miss Farrar has her own small piano, so that she can bring you from time to time excerpts from the opera playing her own accompaniment. We are happy to present that warmly admired and loved person who has won worldwide renown as a prima donna, one who can capture the spirit of opera so well, and who can translate for us all its moods, its artistic beauty, its colorful drama, and the personalities of the composers and of the opera stars of both present and past times. Geraldine Farrar. Good afternoon, my radio opera friends. One day last week, I made a pilgrimage to my roomy attic where my many opera scores now rest neatly packed upon their shelves. I took down a well-worn volume, its brown pages thumbed, torn and repaired, bearing silent evidence of its years of use. It was a Christmas gift to me from my mother during my student days in Berlin. At that time, I must add, my gifts were confined to books and music. In faded gold lettering on the cover is my name and the title of today's opera. La Traviata. The score is in Italian. To metropolitan audiences, who are accustomed to hear Italian operas invariably sung in Italian, it may seem wholly unnecessary to mention this fact, but Berlin audiences expected to hear their operas sung in German, even if the libretto had been originally written in another tongue. Fortunately, I was permitted for a while to be an exception to the rule. For two years, in fact, I was allowed to sing my roles in Italian until I had become thoroughly familiar with German. As I sat in my attic, turning these yellow pages, the years rolled back and distant, long-ago scenes came to me. I felt like a spectator who was observing the stage through the wrong end of an opera glass. I see myself, and it is a November evening in the year 1901, the same year in which the death of Queen Victoria drew the curtain on one of the most distinctive and colorful periods of modern history. And as I look at myself in retrospect, I see that I am young, incredibly slender, with a wasp-like waist so much admired during that epoch. My masses of dark hair are heavy under a coronet of diamonds. Billowing behind me ripple yards of long white satin while I toy with a huge feather fan. I am singing La Traviata, my second role as a debutante soprano before a critical Berlin audience. The entire cast sings in Italian out of complimentary deference. The vigorous applause with which the audience expresses its approval is most heartening to a young singer, as you may well imagine. It is a gala occasion, for royalty is present, and it also expresses enthusiastic approval. After that performance, Traviata became a favorite role in my repertoire and continued as such for many years. La Traviata literally means gone astray, and the romantic story of its appealing heroine is based on fact. Before the composer Verdi, that grand old man, as he was affectionately called, had conceived his musical framework for the frail Violetta, she had already become well known to the literary world through the romance written by the amazing Alexandre du Marquis. Dumas had drawn his story from a living model and relates this meeting with her. You ask me how I first came to meet that exquisite young woman, Marie Duplessis, to give her her own correct name. I met her in the most charming, fashionable imaginary. It is to her I owe a large influence upon my literary career as novelist and playwright. I wrote my book in three weeks at a little table in a room at saint germain en laye near Paris, where I worked steadily in a miserable little room that cost me one franc a day. An elegant establishment nearby was the rendezvous for gay crowds, the bells and dandies of that glittering Second Empire. Marie Duplessis was a frequent visitor. In the courtyard, there grew a cherry tree, the ripe fruit to try. One day I asked the innkeeper if I might climb the tree and pick some fruit. He replied, laconically, if you like, but there is already someone in the tree. I needed no further encouragement and started upward. In truth, seated in the fork of the fruit-laden branches, there was a charming young person quite at home on her unusual perch, 
picking the luscious cherries with tranquil enjoyment. You permit, mademoiselle? That was the greatest pleasure, monsieur. And so it was on a fine June day that an impetuous youth of 20 and a pretty girl made their acquaintance a little nearer heaven than usual. Such was Dumas' first meeting with Marie Duplessis, the actual heroine. She was a spectacular figure of the half world. Gentle and refined, she moved among her associates, conspicuous in her sumptuous surroundings, fine jewels and frocks, and recognized by a singular fancy. She always had with her a bouquet of camellias, her favorite flower. She either carried them or wore them on her breast or in her hair. Sometimes white, sometimes red, but never did she appear without them. Whereupon her charming sobriquet, the Lady of the Camellias, or in its more melodious French original, La Dame aux Camellias. Shortly after the success of the novel, Dumas put his appealing heroine into the play of the same name. It was created by the immortal Sarah Bernard. With what tear-drenched eyes I used to watch her from the student gallery in her Paris theater. Many fine actresses have played this essentially tender and feminine role. The Italian Bruiser, the English Neversoul, and our own Ethel Barrymore and Eva Le Gallienne. There are so many beautiful phrases in this opera that one has an embarrassment of riches. The vocal demands can be met by either a coloratura or lyric soprano, while the dramatic side is varied and appealing. I have always been haunted by a particularly lovely phrase that Violetta sings in the act we are about to hear when she consents to release Alfredo at the entreaty of his father. The melody seems to embody her spirit of sacrifice in this way. the same act when the father comforts Alfredo for Violetta's seeming treachery. How superbly his gorgeous melody rings out. I shall try to be the baritone for a moment and bring him these lovely measures that Lawrence Tibbetts will sing. Mm. Thank you, Miss Farrar. We are happy to present Geraldine Farrar. A pleasant feature of being a retired person, no longer on the professional stage, is the relief from that continuous artistic responsibility which dogs the footsteps of an operatic singer every minute of the day and night. Now that I am no longer restrained by a nervous apprehension of fatigue, colds, and other incidentals so nerve-wracking to the singer, I am able at last to go about freely to operas, concerts, and plays. And in this, the light of a seat on the public side of the footlights, I have ample occasion to enjoy and applaud our young stars of today. It was back in 1921, at a special matinee, that I first heard the glorious voice of our star of today's opera. Those special matinees were usually composed of several acts from different operas. Thus, many styles together offered an unusual attraction to the crowds that made the occasion a gala one. I had sung an act of Bohème, and it was from the dusty wings, seated in impromptu fashion on a packing box, that I first heard and saw Rosa Pancel. That day, she sang a scene from her first great success, La Forza del Destino. Ever since, and, but as a sincere admirer, 
I have followed her career with warm interest and various vocal endowments. In fact, musical affairs recently with this vivacious prima donna was interesting to hear the fair to provide. Like my great teacher, Lily Lehman, and all celebrated vocalists, as a matter of fact, Miss Poncel advocates melodious Italian school of the to keep the voice free and elastic, so that its luscious quality also never strained out of its normal range. How I wish we would all realize this great secret, quality, not quantity, above all. Pleasure has offered one in the other soprano, having many outstanding singers for trip part since the 80 years ago, Salvini Donatelli first sang it at the window. In our city, Melba, Sembrick, and Gallicucci have vocal exhibitions in this low world. The fabulous singing of Petrucini was in no wise disturbed by a silhouette of very buxom outline. Frankly, I feel of the wind. One of the most thrilling occasions in my whole career was when I sang Traviata in this great metropolitan opera house for the very first time. Miss Conrad was then its managing director, and he was kindly disposed to my impatient wish to be heard in other roles than Juliet and Butterfly. As the company then boasted quite a few celebrated sopranos who shared the repertoire, I thought I never would be allowed to enlarge my own operatic gallery. However, one week before my birthday, he told me I might sing Traviata at a Saturday matinee, just such a one as we are enjoying this afternoon. And to complete my happiness, I was to have Caruso as my partner. I was so excited I could hardly sleep waiting for the day. And how good the boys backstage were to make possible my little touches and changes that I wanted. A spotlight just when needed, a couch piled high with my own lovely lace pillows and covers, you can have no idea how important such little details can be. Things that are often taken for granted by the audience, or even in some cases overlooked, are necessary to the operatic singer, who should leave no stone unturned to make the best possible impression as an interpreter of her role. And so it was that the 28th of February in the year 1907 proved to be a very happy repetition of that earlier Berlin case. My first real test came near the close of the first act, with a very touching air, A for Louis, which you will recall, so charmingly sung today by Miss Rosa Poncel. Libera that follows directly after. Goes in this way. <laughs> applause that came as the curtain fell on that first act. Caruso was a perfect dear, as always, and shoved me continually alone before the great gold curtain. And when his own air came in the second act, the roar of the crowd was as much for the generous comrade as it was for the artist. Thank you, Miss Farrar. Once long ago in Berlin, at a small gathering to honor Cosima Wagner, I was requested to sing and play my own accompaniment. The imperious figure of the great composer's widow would have intimidated a far older and more experienced person than I was then. Besides, the master, meaning, of course, Wagner, 
would be sympathetically received. I felt somewhat disturbed. Modestly, I explained to Frau Wagner that I was not proficient in German, and my repertoire was the Italian and French school. She nodded, however, and I sang the plaintive air which you are to hear in the closing act of our opera this afternoon, as Violetta lies frail and forlorn on her deathbed. All honor to the musical genius of Verdi, Wagner's great contemporary, that, as I sang, the haughty face of Cosima Wagner softened and a gracious compliment was my reward. I should like to bring you just a few measures of this delicate and lovely air. Note how exquisite is the picture of musical melancholy as the dying Violetta sadly contemplates her all too truthful mirror. <laughs> Every aria in the opera brings back some memory to me. Incidents at times thrilling, at times touching, and sometimes laughable. Back in the first act, you will remember, we heard that gay ensemble at the supper table when the guests, led by Alfredo and Violetta, join in this very vivacious melody. <laughs> In connection with this number, I recall a most amusing incident that happened to me. I was a guest performer in a small town near Berlin that boasted a charming opera house. As is general in such circumstances, we had only a piano rehearsal with conductor and cast in the small room, so that I appeared before the footlights that evening without ever having rehearsed the stage action with the other members of the company. As this milting song marks the first meeting of Violette and Alfredo, I used to drink a toast and then cast aside the wine glass, the better to extend my hand for him to kiss. On that particular evening, I drank the toast and threw aside the glass in my customary way. But my aim was far from true. The glass fell far wide of the wings and rolled about the prompter's box in tinkling fragments. Imagine my surprise to see with no interruption of music or stage play an attendant in uniform stalk on the stage in full view of the public. In his hand, a bright new dustpan and a whisk broom. He proceeded leisurely to sweep up the fragments and walked off unconcerned to the merriment of public and singers as well. But that was not all. The following day, when my check was presented to me, it was accompanied by a slight bill for breakage, 25 cents, about six cents, for the previous evening's little gesture with the wine glass. It seems strange to us today that when Verdi produced Traviata in Venice in 1853, it was a dismal failure. Who can explain the reason? Perhaps it was because the costumes were everyday ones in the fashion of the times, but not those of a legendary age or of distant antiquity or the glamorous attire of a foreign land, as was usually the case with operas. The performers, too, were far from ideal. The tenor struggled with hoarseness and was mostly inaudible. The baritone sulked because of the infrequent demands on his voice and the smallness of his role. His indifference completely ruined the touching second act, wherein a fine artist will certainly make the role an important one. However, the misfortune of the evening lay in the extreme amplitude of the prima donna. She was so inordinately stout and shapely that all references to the delicate health and subsequent death scene of this all too buxom Violetta sent the audience into frank expressions of gleeful mockery. 
But Verdi, confident of his work, was not discouraged. Later performances with more discreet actors met with overwhelming success, and the opera remains a favorite to this day, and it will always remain so, as long as those who carry its message across the footlights have vocal ability and personal charm. Who can listen unmoved to the lovely duo that closes the turbulent career of this frail heroine? As Violetta and Alfredo plan to spend happy hours together far from Paris, hours, alas, they will never come true. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Farrar.